What we are going to do now is talk a little bit about kind of the bigger picture of just scientific method. Because again, like I've been mentioning, part of our lab is about thinking about how do we learn stuff about, you know, in this case, the body, but in general about everything. I mean, again, I, maybe I should, let me, you know, here is our textbook with all this stuff in here. And you're like thinking like, Oh, if you want to know how things work, you just look it up in a book. But it's like, no, it's like at some point, somebody had to go out and figure it out. And then they write it in a book. And, and how come the book from 50 years ago is no longer useful because we learn more or we start changing our understanding even. So what I'm going to talk about now is a little more about kind of that process where people are trying to figure this stuff out and you know its strengths and some of its weaknesses and i think it's i think it's just interesting to think about and it also just kind of gives you more you know more of an ability to kind of assess things when you read some scientific study you'll the more and more you know about how this process is done the more and more you'll be able to decide whether or not you trust what this person's conclusions are. So it kind of makes you a more um, sophisticated consumer of information, which I think is particularly the world has been getting freaking weirder and weirder in terms of people just saying anything, whether it's true or not, or supported or not. So having kind of more of a skill set in like thinking like, like, you know, are these people all freezing because of windmills? It's like, no, probably not. It's like, uh, um, let's go. Okay. And I can also just say, a lot of these things depend on who you ask. Like, what is science? You know, um, one of the definitions that I am going to kind of be sticking to that I think is a useful definition and kind of it works for me. I have this thing, Arthur Strahler. Science is the acquisition of reliable but not infallible knowledge of the real world, including explanations of the phenomena. So. So reliable but not infallible means, you know, that's why we're going to be using probabilities and things. We don't know. We, we, we're doing our best. That's also why things change or our understandings of things change as we get better tools or, you know, kind of look at things more closely. Um, you know, knowledge of the real world, we're actually poking and prodding at actual things and seeing how they respond or react. You're not just making it up in your head, you know, and there are different kinds of, of research, right? There is research um, where you have, you know, in the humanities, it's kind of off on, you know, this, on this side, if you're doing research in some English class or some history class, you're still doing research, but you're kind of looking at papers and you're reading things and you're trying to like, you know, understand some, you know, what, what were the forces going on in society when such and such happened or whatever. But that's not what we're going to be talking about. This is kind of more, this is kind of more like a qual, you know, study of human affairs. We're going to be looking at this kind of more empirically based. You know, this is basically based on kind of you know, observations of the physical world. You know, we're gonna basically 
look at things, add drops of acids and bases and measure the pH and see what's happening and all that, right? Um, so this, there's this different kinds of research, but again, we're gonna do the research that's more based on the real world rather than on kind of, you know, ideas. And there's also things like logic. You know, logic is going to be useful when you're kind of trying to analyze things or come up with hypotheses, but it's not going to give you the answers you're looking for. Logic is, pure logic isn't connected to the real world, right? You're not actually checking, like, make sure my logical argument is actually supported by empirical observations. Um, like, the, there's a classic example of Aristotle who was pretty brilliant, came up with all sorts of cool scientific stuff. He, though, had a, you know, in his mind, a very solid logical explanation of why women have fewer teeth than men. And he didn't bother even, you know, it was so obvious to him logically why it was true. He just like moved on. Like, obviously because of this, women have to have fewer teeth and let's move on. But he never did the experiment where like, let's get some women, let's get some men, count how many teeth they got and see if it actually is true or not based on actual observations. Um, so you can't just use logic. Logic is helpful, but you know, not sufficient. It's not okay just to like, well, it makes sense. So it has to be true. It's like, you, 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 you get bitten in the butt a lot of times when you just, when you do that. Um, there's a lot of stuff that seems like obviously it has to be true. And then when you look closer, you realize, um, actually this is weirder than I thought, or there's something going on I didn't realize was there. Um, and then, I'm gonna mention this just because people often, so belief fields, these are things where you can't prove one way or another. You just know or don't know, you believe or you don't believe. This would be like religion. There's a God, there's no God. Um, ethics, morality, you know, abortion is a right for everyone. Abortion is wrong and, you know, should never happen. You know, it's, it's not something you are ever going to get at with, you know, doing the critical experiment and, you know, get the answer. Um, and a lot of times, again, I put like this verses, a lot of times people think of these as things that are in conflict, you know, and sometimes they can be, but in general, they are often informing each other, which I think is useful to bring in. Like the idea of you know, abortion, like if you're wondering, trying to decide is abortion right or wrong, it probably would help understanding the science of conception and development and what actually is pregnancy and what is the development of a human from a sperm, you know, to a, you know, a free living organism. Um, science, can often be um, very um, indebted to ethics and morality to kind of guide which direction, what do you actually want to try to understand or learn about? Like, you know, we have the ability to make weapons to annihilate every living human being in the unit, you know, on the planet. But does that mean we, that's where we should put our energy and try to figure that out? Or, some of the science around genetics has gotten, just in the last few years, um, has been getting more and more intense. Like it wasn't all that long ago that, you know, the first mammal was cloned with Dolly the sheep. I remember when that happened, I'm like, oh man, all right, there's a can of worms. I was always kind of like, there's questions we didn't have to ask because we just didn't, it didn't matter. But now with CRISPR Cas and stuff, you can just, really go in and finally edit a genome and a germline cell and, you know, kind of 
custom tailor a human being in a lot of ways, but not actually knowing the bigger picture of what the heck you're doing or like eliminating. I know some people who think like mosquitoes are annoying. So let's use our genetics and stuff to like basically eliminate mosquitoes. But then it's like, okay, only females when they're breeding bite you and actually mosquitoes are important pollinators and like, and they're food sources for a lot. Like what the heck are you doing here? So like having, having kind of morality ethics kind of guide, like what are you doing with your science? I think is really important. Like if you have science without this kind of a context, you get people doing some pretty messed up stuff that could end up actually really having consequences they were never imagining or didn't intend. So just kind of putting that out there. These, they're not, they're not, they're not enemies. They're very different from each other and they can actually be be helpful for each other um okay continuing on here so So for things to be studied by the scientific method, you have to be able to kind of observe and measure them. Um, it's not gonna be possible to use science to decide which are cuter, bunny rabbits or puppy dogs. You know, there's no way to, at some core level, measure the intrinsic quality of cuteness in something. Um, you could ask another question. If your question was, you know, what do College of Marin students consider cuter? You know, then you could show them pictures and say, pick the cutest one. And then you could, you could, there you have something you could actually measure. But you know, the intrinsic qualities, like you couldn't say, you, know, you could say which, which tends to eat more food, bunnies or puppies, you know, because then you could just measure how much food they're eating, but you couldn't ask like, you know, which, which one is cuter. Um, so there's that. Um, other things. Should mention um, most scientific inquiry is interdisciplinary. You know, this idea of biology, physiology, um, you're probably noticing already, like three weeks into this class that biology is completely entangled with chemistry. Like there's no way you're gonna actually ask an interesting question about the body probably without bringing chemistry into it. And there's gonna, we're gonna see, we're gonna get more into the physics of fluid flow and this and that. Like when you go to a conference now, like I go to these neuroscience conferences every year, you know, a lot of the research is looking at you know people designing a virus that will infect a neuron and affect it in a particular way which then changes it and makes it easier to like study its behavior in a you know living brain in a mouse or something so you have people designing viruses to study the nervous system you have people designing little molecules that turn different colors under different voltages. So you can study the electrical activity in the brain in real time, but it's actually these chemists that are designing these cool little molecules. So this idea that, you know, my background is actually bioengineering. You know, I'm mainly interested in the, in the brain and how it processes information and all, but 
you know, I spend a lot of time using skills that you usually use for um, looking at signal processing in electronics in order to actually analyze the information flow in the nervous system. So kind of putting that out there that, you know, biology, you know, chemistry, you know, it's a useful, it's kind of like when we talk about the systems in the body, the, you know, the urinary system, the cardiovascular system, it's, it's a useful approximation to kind of look at things from a distance, but once you get closer, everything gets really entangled. Um, other things. Basic versus applied research. So this is a, an important um, distinction that's worth worth thinking about. What what do we mean by basic research or applied research? Anybody? This is like, you know, you're curious. Basic research is I want to know how it works. Like I, like you, know, my, my dissertation work was like, how the heck does the ear manage to um, analyze the frequency and timing information of, of the sounds coming in just using a bunch of cells and goopy membranes and stuff. So it's just kind of fascinating. How the heck does it do it? Applied, there's some reason. Usually this has to do with more clinical kind of stuff. Like, you know, somebody, there's some disease. You know, somebody has diabetes or Alzheimer's or something. So you're trying to understand how you know, the pancreas or how the brain is doing what it does normally and under a disease condition. So you can figure out interventions and therapeutics that might help these people. So in clinical research, typically there is a specific problem that you're trying to get at. Um, there's a, a more modern word, which now people use a lot. This is, this is like, in scientific research, this would kind of like the way like equity and inclusion would be like, you can't read anything about education without equity and inclusion. You can't really read much about research these days without seeing the word translational. Translational is kind of like this bridge between basic and applied. It's like, yes, we are interested in how things work, but it's also useful to see how can it be used in a practical way or a therapeutic setting or this or that. So when you see this word translational research, it's just meaning, you know, research that can be translated into a more therapeutic or clinical setting. Um, you know, obviously in general, basic research tends to happen more in universities. Applied research tends to be more in industry. You know, if you are Genentech, you can't just be curious. You have to make some drugs that you can sell and support your bottom line. Um, if you're in a university, you write grants that, you know, from the National Institute of Health or somebody, and they might support you just because you're curious. Although, like I said, these days, this translational thing is usually a big part of things as well. Um, you know, and even if you're a Genentech, I have friends that are scientists at Genentech and they let them also, sat, most people go into science because they're just curious. So even in the in, in industrial in labs, especially labs like Genentech, they'll let the, let the scientists follow their nose of just things that they want to learn about because they want to keep them happy. And also you don't always know what you don't always know what's out there. If you only looked for the things you knew you could find, you'd miss out on a lot of cool, amazing things. 
You know, there's no way you can predict everything that is cool to find until you just start blindly poking around and noticing like what is there. Um, so apply basic, I think that's where in again, these, these often there's a blurring here. And there's also, there's a good quote, Carl Sagan had a quote, because sometimes people do say, well, why, if we have a limited number, limited amount of resources, shouldn't we just use the resources to help people who are sick rather than just satisfy our curiosity? Um, and like I said, a lot of times the things that are really important to know, you don't know that they're there until you just start exploring. Um, so here, this is a quote by Carl Sagan that I think, I think is nice. He said, Maxwell wasn't thinking of radio, radar, and television when he first scratched out fundamental equations of electromagnetism. Newton wasn't dreaming of space flight or communication satellites when he first understood the motion of the moon. Röntgen wasn't contemplating medical diagnoses when he investigated a penetrating radiation so mysterious he called it X-rays. Cure, Madame Curie wasn't thinking of cancer therapy when she painstakingly extracted minute amounts of radium from tons of pitch blend. Fleming wasn't planning on saving the lives of millions with antibiotics when he noticed a circle free of bacteria around a growth of mold. Watson and Crick weren't imagining the cure of genetic diseases when they puzzled over the X-ray diffractometry of DNA. Um, so blah, blah, blah. Just this idea, the basic research often does take you really useful places. So this idea of just trying to solve problems you know about isn't necessarily you know, the best thing, even though at some level it, you know, it might seem superficially like a good idea. Um, so let's get just a little more into the big picture and then we'll talk about more of the specifics of designing an experiment. Okay. Um, and there's also no apps, no absolutes. So no, um, how do I want to say this? No absolute scientific truths. So this is important. This is a big difference between belief fields like religion or something. Like science never says this is absolutely true. It says, this is our best understanding given the information we have and our way of understanding that information. Um, so probability is important. Right, I mean, I can say like, I can have a statement, my, my statement that like the sun will come up tomorrow. or it will be sunny tomorrow. You know, based on everything we know about astronomy and thousands of years of recorded, you know, human history describing like, you know, the celestial bodies, probability is very high that the sun is gonna come up tomorrow. Like I would bet my life on it that tomorrow morning the sun is going to rise. Um, you know, and it might not. It could be there's some weird thing about physics that we don't understand, and the sun winks out of existence. It like just disappears, or you know, something about its nuclear fusion goes wrong, and all of a sudden it, it just explodes and it's gone. There's no sun tomorrow morning. But I can say everything we understand about astronomy and about what the sun is and how it works, very high probability.
right? Just because I'm saying there's no absolute scientific truth doesn't mean like, yeah, it might be true, it might not be. You know, some of the stuff like this, we can say it's really, really likely true. Other things like it will be sunny tomorrow, you know, weather prediction is a little sketchier. There's a, I can predict that this, you know, you've, I'm sure you've all experienced this with your little weather apps. Like, right, it was supposed to be sunny today and it's not, or wait, it was supposed to rain and it's like sunny. Oh, stoked. So here you can make this prediction, but you know, it's gonna probably be lower probability about whether it's really true. You know, neither case is as true, but one of, you know, probability, that's why I was saying in, in most science up to at least recently as people are revisiting this a bit, if you can do the statistical analysis and say, I trust my results within a 95% confidence that it's true, then you get to publish it and say, this is likely true. Like you do some study about caffeine improving people's tests taking in their exams. If you can do this experiment and you do the statistics and it says, well, 95% or better chance that my results really do say that, well, then I can publish it. It means I might be wrong. You know, it could be there's some mess up in just my, the um, subjects that I chose or whatever. But just kind of putting that out there, no absolute scientific truths. But that being said, there are things like global warming. You know, it's, there's a, the preponderance of evidence is there's something going on that we need to worry about, right? If you look at the number of, you know, are there scientists who say, I'm not sure we need to worry about it? Sure, but if you look at, there might be a hundred of people saying like, no, I'm looking at this and interpreting the data and there really is an issue here. And maybe one that's saying, well, I'm interpreting it a different way. So, you know, so nobody's absolutely true, but I would say the chances are if, you know, a hundred people are all saying like, no, I'm interpreting this data a certain way. It's more likely that that's what's going on evolution similar kind of thing. You know, there's no way to actually ever say for sure, for sure. And the details about how it works, you know, we change in terms of some of the subtle details of how we think it unfolds. But, you know, there's so much evidence that that is how we got to end up with human beings from bacteria that, you know, I would say it's really, really likely. So, so then this idea, all scientific statements must be testable. If you make some statement, you can't just say it and then walk away. There has to be some way to test it or else it's not something that you can deal with in the scientific method, right? If I, you know, everybody who hangs out actually has their little like, you know, guardian angel hanging out on their shoulder, making sure that, you know, guiding them along. You know, how could it not be? Because there's so many times things should have gone south, but like kind of miracle, everything turned out okay. You know, that's not something that you're ever going to answer with the scientific method, right? Because we can't test it. We can't test our, you know, we don't have anything that measures angel energy or whatever. Um, so that's not something you're going to look at with the scientific method. You're going to have to ask something more like, you know, which eats more rabbits or puppies. That's something you can measure. You can test. You can actually look and find an answer. And so statements must be testable. Tests must be reproducible. This is important too. Again, because of this probability, just because you see something once, you know, I dropped my piece of chalk and it didn't break. I guess chalk is imbreakable. Chalk never breaks. 
it's like, eh, probably that one time it managed to not break. But if I did the same experiment again and again, I would probably notice a lot of the times the chalk does break when I drop it. Right. So if you want to really increase the probability that your statement is is likely to be true, if you do the same thing again and again and keep getting the same answer, that is more and more evidence that you are more probably getting at something that's true. You know, and this is also how kind of the scientific community polices itself is different people do the same thing and hopefully get the same answer. Um, so I'm gonna say this. So science relies on skepticism. So meaning like, so this is something like sometimes as a scientist, I sometimes don't even realize I'm making somebody feel bad. It's like somebody says something and I'm like, huh, really is, let's, let me think about this. And that's just kind of how you're trained as a scientist. It's not like, oh, I don't believe you. It's more like whenever you hear something, you kind of look at it with a more of a fine tooth comb and does this make sense? And then you might do the experiment again, or maybe do it in a slightly different way and make sure you're getting the same answers. Um, so skepticism and science relies on the interaction of the community. When you write a scientific paper that is describing your results, it doesn't just get published it goes to a bunch of other experts in the field that look at it and read it and decide like, does this make sense? Did this person miss something? So you're working with a lot of people because you know, a human, you know, human, or I should say scientists are fallible humans. They make mistakes, they have biases, they see the thing they wanna see, even if other people are looking at the same thing and like, I don't really see that there. So by having a lot of scientists working together and kind of checking each other's work, you're more likely to transcend the fallible human and get more at kind of the true nature of the universe. Um, The other thing about this community is it's necessary because most of the interesting questions are really complicated and big. And I think I mentioned early on in the semester that when you design an experiment, when you come up with your objective, it has to be very narrow. Like I'm interested in hearing for my dissertation work. And I ultimately asked the question about low frequency vibration processing in the saculus of the bullfrog inner ear. And that took me again, like, you know, four or five years of my life, right? That's, uh, and I came up with some stuff that, you know, I, I think is interesting, but it's only interesting in a bigger context of lots of other people all working on different parts of the same big questions and building a bigger, understanding that we work with. You know, human beings only live like, you know, if you're lucky 80, 90 years at most, then you're dead. Um, and if you really wanted to look at some of the really interesting questions at a deep level, it would take way longer than that. You know, so based on this kind of, kind of flash in the pan lifespan we've got, we have to have lots of different scientists all doing different parts of one big question at the same time and putting them together if we're gonna actually get a bigger picture. So, so that's that. Interaction, the community, one is so we can put stuff together to build a bigger understanding, but also so we can police each other and make sure that people aren't, aren't um, making mistakes or, um, succumbing to human nature and seeing biases and things like that. 
So any questions about that? All right, so now what I want to do, we'll talk a little bit more about scientific um, experiments and how you design experiments, because I think that is useful as well. Especially, I noticed like when we were doing this stuff earlier, some people were not as clear about what placebos were used for and stuff like that. I think kind of seeing how that fits in, like how a basic clinical trial works, I think is useful. Um, so let's first start with hypotheses. So let's, let's assume you have an objective. You have your objective, we talked about that. You've got a clear idea of what question you're asking. And then you're gonna come up with your hypothesis, what you think you're likely to find. How do people come up with hypotheses? What are some of the ways hypotheses are derived? You've been doing it, so how have you been doing it even? Is it by observing something? Listen, I... Before, so, oh, I mean, so I guess what we could say is if you've been watching the world, you've probably noticed different trends. So yeah, so one, one thing we have is called inductive, inductive reasoning, kind of generalizing um, specific observations. Like I seem to notice like whenever somebody is being an idiot on the road, they seem like they're checking their phones. It's like this, you know, going down Sir Francis Drake and somebody like almost hit me. It's like they're on their freaking phone. And then you're like on the freeway and somebody is like, like drifting out of their lane and you look over, it's like they're on their freaking phone. You know, so you start like saying, wow, I'm noticing this trend. You know, and we do this all the time, and this is gonna. This is how you make dinner conversation. Um, but if you're, if you want to take it further and see, like, is it really a, a thing, or is it just something that seems to be a thing because I'm noticing it? Then you got to do a more rigorous experiment or study. So if you have specific observations that are making you think that this is likely true. And then you say, well, I think it's actually not just these specific observations, but I bet you it's true in general. And so my hypothesis is people are a menace on the road when they're, you know, using their, their, their cell phones, or you know, I should say, people are not as good drivers when they use their cell phones. That's my hypothesis. That would be an example of inductive reasoning. I'm taking my specific observations that I've been noticing and I'm generalizing it and say, not just those idiots, but in general, all drivers that are on their cell phones are gonna be not as safe drivers as people who are not using their cell phones. So that's what we call inductive reasoning. And again, you do it all the time. What are other ways you can come up with a hypothesis? Using knowledge from a previous experiment. Yeah, exactly. Did, did everyone hear Chris using kind of previous knowledge? So this is called deductive reasoning. You know, using kind of logic and previous knowledge. Like with caffeine and test scores, I can say, well, I know caffeine is a central nervous stimulant and keeps people awake and alert longer. And I also know in general, when people are studying longer and more focused, they tend to do better on tests. So I am going to hypothesize that people who are drinking more coffee then and therefore are awake and alert more are gonna do better on their tests. I'm using stuff I already know and using some logical connections and coming up with my hypothesis. Doesn't mean it's true. I got to do the experiment to see if it's true. Like I said, logic doesn't always get you to the right answer. Sometimes it gets you to an answer that seems like it should be true, but when you actually look, you realize like, oh, um, it's not. 
Um, what other ways do people come up with hypotheses? So the thing about this, both of these are very kind of brainy. Um, they all make it sound like science is about logic and reasoning. You know, a lot of times people come up with hypotheses um, in a little more of a random kind of way. Um, and it's worth putting this down just so you get a sense of the more real human part of science, like intuition. You know, particularly people who've been studying a particular field for a long time, they often have just an intuition about what might be happening based on what's going on. Like there's a few, like one of the classic examples was Kekulin. He was the guy who came up with the, um, the benzene ring, the aromatic ring. Like he knew that benzene was, you know, had six carbons, but he couldn't figure out how they were connected together in the actual structure. And he had a dream about an Ouroboros of a snake that was just kind of eating its own tail. And like in the morning, he like realized, oh my God, it's, I've been missing it. It's the ring structure, you know? But it wasn't, it came to him in a dream. Um, so things like that are important to kind of honor. Um, serendipity, another one. Does serendipity mean? Isn't it just kind of like by chance? Yeah, it's kind of like happy accident or, you know, yeah. the classic examples of serendipity are things like when Fleming discovered penicillin, right? He had some, you know, plates of bacterial colonies and there was mold, they had gotten contaminated and there was mold and he's gonna throw them out because they're contaminated with mold and then notice like, oh my God, there's like a zone around this mold where there's no bacteria at all can grow. So he realized like, oh, there's something really interesting here. There's something in this mold that's actually antibacterial that's keeping the bacteria from growing near it. And following up on that, you know, discovered penicillin. But if he just said like, oh, contaminated garbage, threw it away, never would have found penicillin. So sometimes it's just being open to observing things and noticing things and like, whoa, that's weird. What the heck's going on there? You know, that's like the same lab came up when we talk about lysozyme later, this antimicrobial thing in your secretions. Somebody was looking at a slide and some snot basically some mucus came out of their nose and landed on the slide and started um, lysing the bacterial cells. And they realized, oh my God, there's something in mucus that actually lyses bacterial cells. And that's how they track down lysozyme, which is basically dismantling the cell walls and the bacteria. You know, so, you know, sometimes coming up with hypotheses isn't so highfalutin as like inductive or deductive reasoning. It's more, more of this kind of stuff. Um, oh. Okay, I'm looking at the time. All right, I'm gonna spend couple of more moments tying this off. I, I actually want to make sure I spend a little bit of time talking about the pre-lab for Tuesday, um, since the enzyme lab is, is one that requires quite a bit of thinking about what your hypothesis is going to be. But you need to actually understand some of the background information about kind of the dynamics of enzyme-driven reactions to write your hypothesis. Um, so I'm going to spend just another few minutes kind of tying off our discussion or kind of just 
you know, rambling, but I think useful kind of thinking about the scientific endeavor. Um, so, All right, so when you're designing experiments, the thing that you need to worry about is often when somebody knows that something's happening, it's gonna affect the results. So if I am studying, let's say, the effect of caffeine, you know, versus test score, If I just said, so you know, in general, I'm gonna have two groups. I'm gonna have what I'm gonna call my control group and my treatment group. So this gets caffeine. My control group should be exactly matched to my treatment group, except for not getting caffeine. You know, we were talking about all the sources of variability, like things that might affect test scores would be like, you know, are they good students? So I'd make sure you know, they both groups were matched in GPA. So I know if there's a difference between the caffeine and the no caffeine group, it's not about just these guys are better students than them. You know, other things, I should make sure that they're both getting the same amount of sleep. You know, so it's not just because one group is, you know, make sure that they have the same amount of like, you know, oh, I don't know, work. I know like, even with, within our class, sometimes the difference between people struggling or not struggling is like how many hours do they got to work outside of class? So I know that that can affect how well you do in a, in a test. So I try to make sure that we're balanced, that the distribution of um, you know, amount of work outside of class is balanced between the group. So anything that I can imagine would affect my results uh, or affect the test scores, I try to match between the two groups. So if there is a difference in test scores ultimately between them, I can say it's probably the caffeine and not these other things. So that's the first part of setting up the experiment. I wanna have a control group and I wanna have a treatment group. And I want them to be identical as possible. The only thing different being the independent variable. So that's the first thing in setting up an experiment trying to deal with these sources of variability by having them matched so they can't be you know, biasing one group versus the other group. Um, next, there's the whole placebo effect. Where in, People talk about, well, it's not really do it. it placebos actually do do things. Um, it's not like they aren't actually causing changes. You can do, you know, people drinking non-alcoholic beer and they think it's real and they start stumbling around and slurring their speech. Um, people who take painkillers that aren't, you know, that aren't real and yet have a much higher tolerance for pain. So it, there is an actual physical effect that's happening. Something's changing either in their physical body or in their mental assessment of what's going on. So you have to take it into account as being real. So we do not want, I think I misspelled caffeine. So if you have a group that thinks they're getting caffeine or doesn't think they're getting caffeine, that might be enough to make an effect. It might not even be the caffeine itself. It might be thinking that you're taking something that's gonna help you, that might help you. So we have this idea of a blind experiment 
where nobody knows which, which is getting what. You don't know if you're in the treatment group or the control group. You know, that's where we give them like a placebo. You know, so they're both getting something, but you don't know whether it's the sugar pill or it's the no-dose pill, you know, the caffeine pill. And so in a blind study, it would be um, specifically like the subjects or the participants who wouldn't know, but the researchers would. Exactly. Okay. Um, so no. the fact is though that researchers often have biases and they interpret the data based on what they expect is gonna happen. It's a real thing. Um, you know, I'm grading something and I know that these are the caffeine group and maybe it's a partially correct answer, but you know, they're getting partial credit and I give them a higher score than I gave these guys. And I didn't even mean to, be, but it's just, I'm expecting them to do better and I want my thing to be, you know, so double blind means your, the researcher doesn't know who is in which group either until after you're done with the experiment and you unblind it. So this, the researchers don't know. This is to kind of control for researcher bias. Right? Because whether I like it or not, as a human being, I, you know, people tend to see what they want to see. You know, and they tend to interpret things in a certain way based on what their expectations of what they think it should be. Um, it's just, it's just happens. It's the way humans take in information. So doing double blind helps control for that. Right. If you are going to try to, can people tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi? You wouldn't just, you know, you'd make sure that you'd only have things labeled A and B. And we would see which is, do you think is Coke or Pepsi? And you'd say B is Coke, A is Pepsi. And I record the data, but I don't even know which is Coke or Pepsi until after all the data has been taken. So I can't give you subconscious clues that I don't even know I'm giving you about whether it's Coke or Pepsi. It's just labeled A or B and it's not until the experiment is done that we knew which one was which. So double blind is actually important. I mean, I'm running on low on time and I do wanna make sure, so I'm gonna skip ahead to one thing really quick, which I also think is important. All right, to give you a sense also about probabilities and stuff. So let's say we do this experiment. Um, the one I'm gonna show you the clinical trial data for is tagamet, it's something that is for heartburn. So these people have heartburn, you know, some of them get a placebo, like a sugar pill, some of them get the drug, and then we, you know, the independent variable is going to be relief from the heartburn symptoms. And we get the results. We do the statistics and say, hey, it looks like statistically the people who took the actual drug were more likely to have relief from the heartburn symptoms. So it gets approved as a drug and it goes on the market. Does that mean that this drug is always going to fix your symptoms? And if you don't take the drug, the symptoms aren't going to go away. It's like, no, uh -oh. not at all. So this is, I think, kind of sobering to look at what does it mean to be clinically effective? You know, this here is clinical trial data for Tagamet. Cimetidine is its official name. So, and it's basically saying all right, the people who took the drug had 75% of their heartburn episodes received here and like two thirds of the people in this case. But if you take a look, you know, pretty much half the people who took the sugar pill 
got better and said, oh, I, this pill relieved my symptoms. So half the people who took the sugar pill said, oh yeah, this is effective for my heartburn. You know, more people who took the cimetidine, but not that many more. And if you take a look, somewhere between a third, quarter to a third of the people who took the drug didn't get relief. So just because you take this drug, it might mean like a third of the times it's actually not gonna help you. And taking a sugar pill half the time would have been just as effective. So just kind of putting it in some context, what, is, what does it mean when you see these probabilities and put it in a real context? You know, it still means that this drug probably will more likely make it make you feel better, but not necessarily. And there's a good chance you'd feel better if you just ate you know, a spoonful of sugar or something that you thought's gonna make you feel better. You just wait a little bit of time and it makes you feel better. Um, so just kind of putting that out there. Um, you know, and then a lot of times the fact that things only work on some people, we all have very different physiologies. It's why there's so many different drugs for the exact same indication, whether it's heartburn or depression or whatever. The same drug that might help one person very well might not help another person much at all or might actually have really unacceptable side effects on somebody else even. So, but just kind of putting this out there, just because you do a experiment and say this drug helps heartburn, you know, the actual story is actually a little more complicated. Um, and Dagnabbit, we're running low on time. So I'm going to So for the enzyme lab, there is a, hold on, let me double, super double check that I have it here because I don't want to lead you down a wild goose chase. Um, so I'm gonna share the screen. Okay, I did not get to the scientific literature and literature search homework yet. So actually, I'm gonna, it's not published yet. It will not be published until we talk about this next week. There is gonna be a little more I wanted to cover that I didn't. Um, copy of, so the enzyme lab, there is a bunch of background information talking about enzyme and substrate concentration. Um, don't worry about this stuff about um, analyzing the graphs yet. What you wanna just do for our initial, for your hypothesis is just think about the two things that are going on. The, Independent variable is just going to be substrate concentration. Dependent variable is going to be the reaction rate. You know, in this case, we're going to be looking at hydrogen peroxide breaking down into water and oxygen. Um, which is a gas, which we're gonna be able to see bubble up. We're gonna be able to measure how fast this goes by seeing how quickly the bubbles are being formed. So we have a measure of reaction rate. Substrate concentration is just gonna be adjusting different concentrations of hydrogen peroxide. This is gonna be our substrate. So your hypothesis is just gonna be I believe that as we vary substrate concentration in a certain way, reaction rate is going to be affected in a certain way. And we're also gonna have to talk about, there's a, something called um, saturation that happens. This is also should, you should notice this, that's gonna figure into your 
into your hypothesis because as you add more and more and you know, I can show you really briefly. This is supposed to be substrate. Here are my enzymes. You know, and the substrate can bind with the enzyme and the reaction can go. If I start adding in more and more and more and more substrate, eventually I overwhelm the amount of enzyme available. And no matter how much enzyme is there, it, or no matter how much substrate I keep adding, it doesn't matter. The rate is stuck at some maximum because the enzymes are all working as fast as they can. So if all enzymes engaged in reaction going at max, then it doesn't matter. I can even add more substrate. There's no more enzyme free to deal with any extra enzyme, extra any substrate you're adding. So that's what saturation is. You have added in so much of the substrate that all the enzymes are working as fast as they can. They're at, working at some max rate and it doesn't matter. You could have a zillion more substrate molecules thrown into the mix. It's not gonna affect the reaction rate because the enzymes are already going as fast as they can. The whatever additional ones you're adding in are gonna have to wait in the wings until some enzyme becomes free to go to the next one. Right? And remember, they're not used up. So once this enzyme breaks apart this, then it can go to this. And once it breaks out, it can go to this. But if I am at saturation, I am at some max rate. If I'm not at saturation, then it's different. Right? If I'm not at saturation, I add an enzyme, it gets broken apart. I add two ends. Not <laughs> if I add a substrate here, it gets broken apart. I add two subs, I double the amount of substrate. If there's enough enzyme, I'm doubling how fast I'm breaking things apart, right? As long as there's enough enzyme, if I increase the concentration of the substrate, I'm gonna increase the rate of the reaction. Because as long as there's enzyme waiting in the wings, if I add even more substrate, that's gonna get broken out by the enzyme that's waiting there. But again, if I've hit saturation, then all the enzymes are engaged. It doesn't matter how much more I'm going to be stuck at some maximum rate. You can look at those videos. It'll help explain it as well. But so for, for Tuesday, if you have questions, ask me. But for Tuesday, um, come up with a hypothesis. And again, it should just be a couple of sentences. You know, it's, it's, it should not be crazy. Just a couple of sentences, just like any of these other ones. But it's a little more um, theoretically complicated because you've got to bring in this idea of saturation of the enzyme. So questions about any of that? So we will continue talking about um, searching the literature and stuff. There, There is, yeah, I, yeah, I kind of spazzed on our break. So kind of ran out of time here, but I will see you all on Tuesday. I hope you all have a good weekend.